Welcome to the Fitz News Studio for the Week in Review. Yes, I am wearing a suit for those of you watching. Yeah. Uh-uh. I actually had a tie, too, but I spilled some honey mustard on it, so sorry about that. Anyway, lots to cover this week. It's another big week on the Murdoch front. We've got developments, new indictments on the criminal case. We've got a he court hearing on the civil case that has some interesting developments, so a lot of Murdoch news to cover. We've also got some medical marijuana news and some other drug-related political drama, I guess, involving both parties, Democrats and Republicans, and multiple drugs, so stay tuned for that. And we've got a controversy surrounding the new Speaker of the House, Merle Smith, who is facing some criticism from social conservatives over a controversial abortion case he was involved in. And yes, abortion obviously a big issue in the aftermath of the Supreme Court news this week. All that and more heading your way on the Week in Review. All right, so we're starting again this week with the Murdochs. Obviously, last week there was a metric ton of news, breaking news related to this saga. There were developments in the double homicide. There were revelations regarding the history of the financial crimes investigation. Just a ton of news last week on the Murdoch saga. And so we're going to start there again this week. Not quite as big of a, of a week for breaking headlines in the Murdoch case, but there was some substantial motion in the case, particularly on the financial crimes front. There were fresh indictments issued this week. Uh, Alec Murdoch facing additional financial crime charges. Uh, his co-conspirator, who was previously indicted, Corey Fleming, an attorney out of Beaufort, he's facing additional charges. And for the first time, someone affiliated with Palmetto State Bank, the financial institution, which has played a pivotal role, uh, allegedly, in the financial crimes perpetrated by Murdoch and his network. For the first time, someone affiliated with that bank, Russell Lafitte, was indicted. Russell Lafitte facing 21 charges. I want to update you on some numbers. Alec Murdoch is now facing... 82 counts, folks, 82 charges related to the financial crimes investigation. Actually, three of those, I'm sorry, are from the Labor Day shooting, which is also a financial uh, scam, given that there's an insurance scam component to that. So 82 charges Alec Murdoch is facing could put him in jail for 700 years, again, just on those financial crimes. Uh, Corey Fleming facing nearly 20 charges, could face 207 years behind bars, uh, and Russell Lafitte, facing more than 20 charges, could go to jail for over a century. Now, will they see that much time? Probably not, at least not on these charges. But again, we are told from our sources that this is just the very beginning of the financial crimes investigation, which, as our news outlet exclusively reported last week, has been going on now since last April. Apparently, they were looking into Alec Murdoch's finances before the double homicide at Moselle, the, the incident which gained a national infamy and propelled this case onto the national stage. But one of the things that I find fascinating about these latest developments, these latest indictments, is for the first time we're starting to see just how broad this thing goes. It's not just Murdoch and other attorneys. There's a financial institution on the hook now. And this news outlet has written extensively on Palmetto State Bank's involvement with the various Murdoch-related fleecing, including some very controversial uh, high-interest loans that the bank would give to clients of Murdoch uh, and his network of attorney friends related to these fleecings. But the bank's involvement is significant because the folks I've spoken to, sources with direct knowledge of this investigation, they tell us that what we are seeing now with these financial crime indictments is just the very beginning, the tip of the proverbial iceberg as it relates to just a mass of alleged criminality regarding former clients, settlements, uh, fleecing of clients, uh, just a huge huge scam that's beginning to be unearthed. And we see it. Some of these indictments in particular involved uh, settlement funds that were stolen from one client to pay back another. Uh, and that's a pattern that we are going to, according to our sources, that we're going to see much more of in the indictments to come. But there are families, folks, that have been victimized in this case. Hakeem Pinckney, deaf, quadriplegic. His family two of whom nearly killed in the car crash that nearly took his life. He, of course, controversially unplugged from his ventilator, and then a, the Murdoch law firm files the wrongful death suit shortly thereafter. The Satterfield case with Gloria Satterfield, the Murdoch's uh, former family housekeeper. And we're seeing a pattern, folks, of fleecing involving the same cast of characters, Alec Murdoch, Corey Fleming, Palmetto State Bank. It's the same scam, folks. 
And in RICO, they call that a predicate crime. And so, again, we know that the feds are on this case. We know the federal grand jury has been meeting. That was something that was actually exclusively reported by uh, John Monk from the Columbia State newspaper. So we'll give a shout out to Mr. Monk there for his reporting. Uh, but we know that those federal uh, crimes, uh, we know the federal grand jury is investigating those crimes. Fitz News reported a few weeks ago that that federal investigation was ramping up. So expect to see action on that front. But again, just the very beginnings of a massive operation that began way back in April of 2021 which is when the statewide grand jury first began investigating these financial crimes. So count on Fitz News not only to continue to keep you up to speed on that latest indictment count, we call it Murdoch math, uh, but you, you can check the latest Murdoch math numbers out on our news outlet, but also count on us to continue to keep you up to speed on the very latest on the double homicide investigation and the other investigations linked to the Murdoch empire. All right, so the criminal Murdoch developments this week were accompanied by some motion on the civil side of these proceedings. As regular members of our audience are aware, the Murdoch family and Parker's, a chain of convenience stores down in the Low Country and down in Georgia, they're also mixed up in this saga. A wrongful death suit filed by the family of Mallory Beach. Now, Mallory Beach was a 19 year old Hampton County teen. She died in the early morning hours of February 24, 2019, when a boat allegedly driven by Paul Murdoch uh, slammed into a piling on the Archer's Creek Bridge down there just north of Paris Island. And uh, again, if you followed this story, this is really the moment that propelled this case, uh, certainly to the statewide audience, and began to give it sort of a nationwide significance. But it was this case which sparked a wrongful death lawsuit, which sparked some financial disclosures of Alec Murdoch, which sparked an obstruction of justice investigation into Alec Murdoch, who was apparently trying to get his son out of trouble related to this case. And all of these cases sort of drew the light, drew the focus of the state, uh, drew the focus of Fitz News and other media outlets onto the Murdoch family. And it was at that point that things really began to unravel. And in fact, in fact, there was a meeting or a, rather a hearing scheduled in this civil case three days after the Mazelle homicide. And at that hearing, Alec Murdoch was supposed to turn over a ton of financial information. Uh, and in fact, a lot of that information is still being debated and being disputed. Uh, but we went to the court this week in Lexington County. Judge Daniel Hall held court in Lexington County. And the battle was over the Murdoch receivers. And if you've been following this case, you'll know that a judge appointed two prominent attorneys in Columbia, South Carolina, John T. Lay and Peter McCoy, appointed them to serve as receivers. Basically, they are handling Alec Murdoch's assets while he faces these charges. And the goal there is to prevent Murdoch and his allies from basically funneling the money out of his possession, uh, routing the cash uh, to old debts, to family members to shell corps or anywhere else they're trying to hide it and to make sure that that money is accounted for so that Murdoch's victims, a list that again continues to grow and that we apparently have only just begun to tap into, those victims will have some money available for settlements. So we went to court in Lexington County today where Dick Harputlian, Murdoch's top lawyer, argued that the receivers in this case should be dismissed and that the Murdoch family should once again have control over these assets. And in fact, Harpulian adopted quite the bully tactic in the courtroom. He told the judge, hey, listen, if you don't do this, you're going to open Pandora's box for cases across the state. In fact, Harpulian told the judge he's got a case uh, next week where he was going to demand that a receiver be appointed because he felt that this was you know, a new precedent that Judge Hall would be setting in this case. Now, is that accurate? Hmm. The receivers countered that there was clear evidence, clear evidence that the Murdoch family was attempting to manipulate these funds, manipulate these assets, and in fact, trying to prioritize payments so that their family would benefit first and so that they would financially uh, make it through this, uh, this saga unscathed. So it was an interesting back and forth in the Lexington County courtroom today, or rather yesterday, I'm sorry. We, we heard Judge Hall, he heard both of these arguments. He did not rule, did not make a decision. Uh, he said he will rule this coming week. So be on the lookout in the next few days for a ruling from Judge Hall on those financial assets. But again, the bigger picture here 
Where's the money? Where's the money? Is it in crypto? Is it buried in PVC pipes on the Murdoch properties, which is a, a report that we've heard? Uh, is it in offshore accounts? Was it gambled away? Was it? We know one place it wasn't, folks. We know that Alec Murdoch didn't spend it all on opioids, as Dick Harpootlian has claimed in the past. Uh, we know that that is a line of, of, uh, of inquiry that the investigators in this case have told us is not promising, is not leading anywhere. But we don't know where the money went. We don't know where the money went. We know from the criminal indictments that there's clearly a Ponzi scheme or what looks like a Ponzi scheme related to settlements. But again, we don't know where it went. We don't know how we could have lost so much. I mean, we're talking tens of, I mean, potentially tens of millions of dollars. His law firm says he took 10 million. We're up to 8.9 million in money allegedly stolen by Alec Murdoch. Where did it go? What did he spend it on? We're going to continue to follow the story of the missing money in the civil case, while we also continue to follow the latest criminal charges filed against Murdoch and his network of co-conspirators. All right, so we broke a lot of news related to drugs this week, drugs and partisan politics, and we ended up being on the receiving end of criticism from folks who said we were a part of a GOP conspiracy to target black Democrats and then part of a woke propaganda machine uh, targeting Republican lawmakers. So it's fun when you're in the middle, right? You get to call it like you see it and call balls and strikes. But anyway, these drug stories were pretty interesting. And the one that I wanted to start with before we get into the big debate over medical marijuana, I wanted to start with a story that actually ran in the Washington, D.C. Free Beacon, which is a right-leaning publication. Uh, it addressed a gentleman by the name of Jason Belton, who has been accused of participating in a nationwide drug conspiracy uh, involving a group called the Inland Empire. Now, he's facing charges uh, in California. He'll be headed to California later this year to face those charges, but the gist of the story is that he received nine pounds, and not, not an eight ball, nine pounds of Coke in the mail. Now, Belton has professed his innocence, Belton's supporters have come to his defense, and in fact, I wanted to read a statement from the uh, the Congressional, not the Congressional Black Caucus, but the South Carolina Black Democratic Caucus. This is the group that Belton's their third vice chair. He's part of their organization. This is what they had to say about that incident. The coordinated attack of a Republican machine has hit a new and dirty low. A right-wing propaganda publication released an article entitled The South Carolina Democratic Party has a cocaine trafficking problem. Again, that wasn't our story. That was the free beacon. Our, our headline, I thought, was a little better. Cocaine is a hell of a drug, right? F your couch, right? Nobody's remembering this. Ugh. Bring Chappelle back. Anyway, here's, here's the rest of that statement. Jason was never found with drugs. The case was initially dismissed in South Carolina five years ago, and he is innocent until proven guilty. I'm going to skip a bit down to the point that's very interesting. We are prepared to push back against any political assault that seeks to demonize black people or destroy our efforts to flip this state. To flip this state. Now, this is interesting because if you'll recall, this is the group a week or so ago. Brandon Upson is the guy who's the leader of this group. He's the guy who authored this statement. He's talking about flipping the state, obviously, from, from red to blue, okay? But this is a guy who's nonpartisan voter registration group was recently praised by the Republican House of Representatives. In fact, in fact they passed a resolution honoring his group and honoring their work uh, as a nonpartisan voter registration group. Obviously, they found out later it was a bit partisan. Uh, but I think, I think Mr. Upson is showing kind of his true stripes here, letting everybody know that this is a, a partisan issue for him. But be that as it may look, I agree with him. Everybody deserves their day in court. Um, Mr. Belton is innocent until proven guilty, but folks, nine pounds, part of a massive nationwide operation. Mm. Mm. I think where there's smoke, there's fire. In this case, where there's a, a line, there's a pound, there's, anyway, there's something here, folks, and I look forward to seeing what the outcome of that court case is. We will continue to follow that case, but this wasn't the response to our story that was most interesting. We got a response to the story that Literally, I, it's like nothing I've ever seen before, and it didn't target me. It targeted our director of special projects, Dylan Nolan, who, as far, as far as I recall, had no connection to, to this story. But I, for whatever reason, Dylan Nolan is on the radar of a certain someone who was most upset with our coverage. Let's go to that clip right now. 
And we know how to whoop that ass spirit. Mr. Colin. What's that mother name? Give me his name again. And uh uh Dylan. Dylan uh, the, the guy that did the YouTube, uh, YouTube video too. Colin Anderson. According to the reports of Colin Anderson and uh Dylan Nolan. You two haters. Or our two fans, should I say. Y'all gonna sit here and bring up Miss Crystal Matthews' name involved in the drug ring when we all know this woman is, is a single mother that works hard for her respect and work hard for her position. And y'all gonna come and try to hit dirty. Y'all can never play fair. Y'all never played fair for over 400 years with, 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 with the black community. Which is why we are where we are right now, and we have no fear, and we coming for you, for y'all. Okay, so I don't know whether to call law enforcement or, you know, hire a voodoo practitioner for Dylan. Buddy, we got your back, man. <laughs> Whatever you need. But uh, anyway, Dylan took that like a champ. He's not worried about it. Um, we're not worried about it either. Look, you get hit from the left, you get hit from the right. It doesn't matter. We're calling balls and strikes here. We're insisting on accountability. No matter what your partisan affiliation, no matter what your gender, no matter what your your race, your religion, your your creed, any of that, um, if you've got tax dollars, we're going to hold you accountable for them. If you have the position of public trust, we're going to hold you accountable for that trust. Uh, whether you're a politician, whether you're a judge, you name it, uh, we're going to continue to do that no matter what kind of criticism comes our way. So now that we've covered the Coke and the Democrats, let's head on over to the pot and the Republicans. All right, so we've talked about our Democrats and cocaine and how Fitz News was allegedly part of a Republican conspiracy to attack the the South Carolina Democratic Black Caucus. Now we're going to turn to our coverage of medical marijuana, where we were referred to as a woke rag that was unfairly attacking Republicans. So anyway, like I said, it's fun to be in the middle. It's fun to, you know, call it both ways, call it fair. And get criticism from both sides, because to me, that lets me know that we are doing our job. If it was one-sided, then we would probably be one-sided. So I like the fact that we're getting called out from both sides of the spectrum. But anyway, we addressed this earlier this week. We talked about what happened with medical marijuana in the South Carolina House of Representatives earlier this week. And I promised in that segment to address it more extensively in this segment. And I want to do that because this is important. Because what happened in the South Carolina House of Representatives this week was an absolute travesty, folks. It was an embarrassment. Uh, it's a mockery of democracy. Uh, you had an issue that should have had a vote, that people should have had an opportunity to legitimately have back and forth on the issue, uh, and they were denied that by a procedural scam, by a procedural gimmick. And I want to just set the stage here. Here's what happened. The South Carolina Senate earlier this year passed the Compassionate Care Act. Now, that is a medical marijuana bill that is incredibly regulated, a very tightly regulated bill. I think there's only about a dozen of different qualifying conditions that you can, that you can uh, cite if you want to have a medical marijuana, uh, not prescription, but a, a, a phys physician or a pharmacist dole it out to you. And this, these prescriptions, these, uh, these permission slips or whatever you want to call them, they're doled out through a network of pharmacists. Again, it's all incredibly regulated. There's an incredibly limited amount of conditions or number of conditions that you're allowed to, to uh, cite if you want one of these things. It is the most conservative medical marijuana bill in the country, much more conservative than the bill that passed in Mississippi. That's right. Mississippi passed one of these things, people. Mississippi. So Mississippi can do it, but we can't. That tells you something. But anyway... That bill passed the Senate overwhelmingly. Senate Bill 150, Tom Davis of Beaufort, South Carolina is its sponsor. That bill passed the state Senate overwhelmingly, and it was sent to the House back in February. Now, the House sat on it for basically three months, three and a half months, did nothing with the bill, literally let it languish in a committee. When they finally let it to the floor of the House, a member of the House, John McCravey, Greenwood, South Carolina, put up 1,016 amendments. That's right, 1,016 amendments, basically to kill the bill by having too many amendments so you can debate it. Because folks, even if you are able to stop the amendment process by invoking cloture, which takes a majority of the House plus five votes, you still got to spend three minutes on each amendment. So you start adding that up 1,016 times three, that's a lot of minutes. That's a lot of time. That would be multiple days uh, of legislative time 
And again, it's all to stop the bill. It's all to gum up the bill. But lawmakers got together. They said, you know what? This debate's important. We want to have this debate. We will dismiss the amendments that don't that matter, that are frivolous, that are dilatory, I believe is the parliamentary term. We'll dismiss those. We'll pick the 50 or so amendments that are really important, and we'll have that debate. And it's a debate the state should have, people. It's a debate, a debate the state should have had years ago. But anyway, they didn't have that debate. They refused to have that debate because the Speaker Pro Tem of the South Carolina House, an attorney, a former prosecutor by the name of Tommy Pope, simply decided he was going to rule this bill out of order. Out of order. He decided unilaterally from his chair as the presiding speaker of the chamber on that day that this bill was going to be thrown out because according to Pope, it did not conform to the state constitutional requirement that bills which are created to raise revenue must originate in the South Carolina House. Again, as I mentioned, this is a Senate bill. It started in the Senate, overwhelmingly passed the Senate. But is Pope's argument correct? Does it pass constitutional muster? Is the bill really unconstitutional? Well, let's look at it. First of all, in addressing this issue from his purchase speaker pro tem, Tommy Pope, first of all, lied about the bill. He said that the bill created a new tax on medical marijuana. That's false. That is abjectly false. What this bill did was extend an existing sales tax to medical marijuana products that would be doled out through this system that I was just telling you about, the pharmacists, the dispensaries. So that's false. So first of all, he lies about what the bill does and then uses that lie as the basis for his ruling that it's out of order. It's unbelievable. Now, Pope did this because he wanted to keep vulnerable House members who feel that they would be politically hurt by this bill from having to cast a vote on it. But what ended up happening is that his decision was challenged by the minority leader in the House, Todd Rutherford, a guy I criticize often for his abusing the, the court system in South Carolina as an influential lawyer legislator, but Rutherford had it right on this one. Rutherford challenged Pope's ruling and said, wait a minute, you're wrong. You're not getting the bill right. And number two, even if you were, your opinion is inconsistent with what the Senate lawyers have said, the court, the lawyer of the, of the state Senate, the Attorney General of South Carolina, and more importantly, multiple rulings from the South Carolina Supreme Court, all of which stated that bills that have revenue components but aren't necessarily tax bills, they can originate in either chamber. And guess what, folks? If Tommy Pope's opinion on this is correct, we're going to have to go through the state code of laws and sh strike about half of it because there are literally hundreds of bills where you've got revenue components which originated in the Senate. So this Pandora's box has been open here, folks. But anyway... Rutherford made his decision, and there was a vote on this bill. There was a vote, and it failed by four votes, 59 to 55. And there's a group of people I want to call out right now. And there's several people I want to call out. First of all, I want to call out Tommy Pope for voting on his own motion. This is a guy who stands up there, again, who lies about the bill, who gets the law wrong in interpreting it, and yet he comes out and votes on his own ruling? That's a conflict, people. You can't do that. Think if, it, if his vote had been the deciding vote. It's a total conflict. But beyond that, I also want to call out the former Speaker of the House, or the outgoing Speaker, rather, Jay Lucas, who completely punked out, voted the wrong way on this. And I want to call out the new Speaker, Merle Smith, who also punked out on this. I thought Merle Smith supported medical marijuana. Apparently not, because he voted the wrong way. But that's not who I really want to call out here. There's a newly formed group. They came to me last week looking for media attention, and I gave them our, I did an article on them, the so-called Freedom Caucus. All right, there's about 13 of these people, or 14, I'm sorry, there's 14 of these Republican lawmakers, ostensibly for freedom. Well, guess what? Ten, ten members of that caucus voted against medical marijuana. They voted to uphold this bogus ruling from Tommy Pope. So much for freedom, right? <laughs> I guess freedom is what they define it as, which to me sounds a lot like these, you know, new Orwellians in Washington, D.C. You know, it sounds a lot like these new woke orthodoxy types coming out of our nation's capital. Doesn't sound like a freedom caucus in South Carolina to me. But anyway, 
It's all wrong, folks. Again, if you're for medical marijuana, if you're against medical marijuana, you ought to be able to have that debate. That's the debate we ought to have. They had it in the Senate, and the Senate overwhelmingly supported it. They've had that debate in the public, and polls show overwhelming support for it, not only amongst general, the general electorate, but Republican primary voters all over the state. The polling is irrefutable. So we're denying the will of the people. We're refusing to hold a vote. All for what? Anyway, Republicans took it rightfully up the backside. In the aftermath of that, they were criticized in no uncertain terms. I will say this, Tom Davis, the sponsor of the bill, was an absolute statesman about it. You don't see that very often in Columbia. He didn't threaten other people's bills. He didn't call names. He didn't pitch a fit. Tom Davis, I absolutely give him credit. He was an absolute state statesman on this, even after they railroaded him so unfairly in the House. But folks, this is something we're going to be following very closely because South Carolina has got to figure something out. We're a state where the opioid epidemic is literally out of control. Out of control. Overdoses are on the rise. In fact, my news outlet did an exclusive report on that earlier this year that showed how bad the problem is. But we're going to let that go and not pass the most limited, restrictive medical marijuana bill in the country. And, and, and not only are we not going to pass it, we're too afraid in the Republican House of Representatives to even hold a vote on it. And that's what bothers me. Again, as I said earlier, it's not whether you support it or whether you're against it. These people were cowards. They were liars and they were cowards. And if you want a liar or a coward representing you, then by all means vote for one of these 59 lawmakers who pulled this stunt in the House of Representatives this past week. If that's the kind of representation you want, somebody who's going to be dishonest about a bill, someone who's going to be deceptive in the way that they operate in the state house, again, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Anything else? I thought the social conservatives who voted against this bill, they should know their scripture. They should know the next line of that. And so I'm going to call out every one of them, every member of the Freedom Caucus, don't lie. Don't be a coward. Have the debate. And so I want to thank our director of special projects, Dylan Nolan. I only went half of the show, three quarters of the show, with one of these things buttoned <laughs> and the other unbuttoned. But I got them both buttoned now, so there we go. And again, I had a really nice tie to wear today, as I said, but anyway. It's Kisara. Um Obviously, everyone knows there was huge news this week on the issue of abortion. Decision by the United States Supreme Court, well, a pending decision we believe, which would strike down Roe versus Wade and some other key federal case law regarding the right to abortion, nationwide right. This does not obviously impact uh, states. It basically empowers states to set policy on abortion is essentially what's happening. The case Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization uh, comes out of Mississippi. And the court is expected to rule. We think it'll be a 5-4 ruling, effectively striking down Roe versus Wade. So obviously everyone's heard about this. This has been big national news. We're not going to go too deep into that story. But that story did cause me, in looking at the state level, the state debate over abortion, to go back to a case that has drawn a lot of scrutiny within the South Carolina General Assembly. Readers will recall or members of our audience, rather, that the South Carolina legislature passed and the governor of South Carolina signed last year a heartbeat bill, which essentially outlaws the vast majority of abortions in the Palmetto State after a fetal heartbeat is detected. One of the supporters of that bill was Merle Smith, the new, uh, newly elected speaker of the South Carolina House of Representatives. So Representative Smith has always been pro-life, um, from the very beginning of his career in the South Carolina General Assembly to his um, ascension up the ladder through that chamber. He's been a steady pro-life supporter. But there was a case back in 2015 that came to our attention, which has some pro-life supporters questioning his support, questioning whether he is as pro-life as he says he is, and it involved a case out of Sumter where Representative Smith lives, a woman by the name of Kimberly Burgess. 
Kimberly Burgess is a woman who went to Planned Parenthood in Sumter back in 2012 for an abortion, ostensibly. Now, Burgess claims that prior to the abortion, she told the doctor, a Harvey Brown, that she didn't want the abortion. And he is alleged to have slapped her kind of on the thigh a few times and said, no, don't say that. You'll scare off all my, my patients or something along those lines. Well, she filed a lawsuit because a few days later, six days later, as a matter of fact, she had to be admitted to a local hospital with massive bleeding. And according to her lawsuit, she passed her aborted child six days later after she was supposed to have had this abortion. But anyway, it was basically a botched abortion, which put her in serious jeopardy health-wise. And it was also, more importantly, according to her lawsuit, an abortion that was conducted without her consent. And obviously that's a huge difference from just a debate over whether we should have abortions in this country or not. And I want to point something out here because obviously I run Fitz News. I put my opinions out on Fitz News. My opinion is that life is the indispensable liberty, that all of our other liberties flow from it, and that if we don't stand up for life, well, what good are the other liberties, right? But I also want to point out that at my news outlet, we have differing views, okay? There are folks who work for me, work with me, feel differently. And so when I editorialize on this subject, I want to make clear I'm speaking from my personal view. And I want everybody to know that not everybody at my news outlet feels this way, And even if they did, we would still turn the microphone over to dissenting views on this, different views, because again, this is an issue where I'm not going to mansplain stuff, okay? I want everyone to have a take. I want everyone to have a say, okay? So I want to make that perfectly clear before we dive back into this issue, because I think it's important. Anyway, this case involving Representative Smith ended up settling. It settled in 2016. And so we don't really know for sure what happened. Okay, we had obviously Burgess's story, and I found it very interesting though, in the filing from Planned Parenthood, they did not necessarily deny the allegations that were raised by Burgess. They simply said they didn't have enough information to address them one way or the other. So barring the production of any other information, they would deny them. So very interesting the way that that was worded. Now, this, this story broke earlier this week, and it has had an impact on Smith's support. Obviously, Merle Smith is still, he's, he's a lock. He, he will have another vote for speaker uh, later on uh, ahead of the upcoming session. But I don't see this as the kind of story that's going to cost him his, his speakership or even pot- potentially erode his support in a significant way. But there were rumblings among pro-life conservatives who directly challenged Speaker Smith on this. Uh, Apparently, he was contacted by a number of these lawmakers who asked him to explain, hey, you you voted for the heartbeat bill. You claim to be pro-life. What are you doing representing Planned Parenthood in an allegation of a non-consensual abortion? Right? Well, Smith has said, again, not to us. We reached out to him. He did not return our response or did, did not respond to our request for comment. But I have spoke with several lawmakers who talked with him, and apparently his his excuse or his rationalization, justification, explanation is that he was required to represent them due to the fact that they're insurance carrier. Uh, that's apparently he's repping. He's he's there for the insurance money. That's it. So he's not necessarily there to represent Planned Parenthood or the doctor who performed this uh, procedure. He was there to um, for the insurance money. Okay, and I get that, and I've never been the kind of reporter who goes after people for for represent who they represent. Okay, I've gone after lawyer legislators for abusing the system, and I've gone after lawyer legislators and other attorneys for how they conduct themselves in these cases. For example, we've criticized Senator Brad Hutto for slut shaming a rape victim, and we've criticized Dick Harpootlian for. Uh, <laughs> His representation uh, of Alec Murdoch, the way that he sort of uh, spun some very disingenuous and deceptive and 
demonstrably false narratives in connection with that case. But again, I agree, everyone has a right to the best possible representation. And so you are very rarely going to see this news outlet criticize a lawyer for who they represent. Because again, we all have that right. We all have that right. And they have that right. But in this case, I do think a seed has been planted, particularly amongst the social conservatives in that House of Representatives. A seed has been planted. Wait a minute wait a minute, this guy may not be with us the way that we thought he was. And for Smith, again, that's not a big deal right now. And it may not be a big deal two years from now. But this is a guy who's been working for this seat for a while. He wants to keep this seat for the long haul. And if he starts to see a little rebellion on, on his right flank from these social conservatives, that's not good for him. That's not good for him at all. So... We're going to keep an eye on that within the bigger picture of Merle Smith's speakership. And again, I addressed that at length earlier this week when he was uh, appointed. Talked about the things he's going to have to do if he wants to make that position mean something, have a positive impact for South Carolina. Uh, but certainly if there's a, a growing rebellion on his right flank, that could severely impact how he governs. And so this is an issue we're going to keep an eye on. But again, that story broke on Fitz News earlier this week. And I thought it was very interesting because it did tie in with that broader national debate over abortion. Count on Fitz News to bring you our assessment of all those issues, hot button social issues. We're not afraid to talk about them. But more importantly, count on Fitz News to always extend this microphone to anybody that's got a credible take on that issue, whether they're pro-life, pro-choice, you name it. We're here to share your side of the story. All right, so that's it for this week's edition. Next week, we're going to have our executive editor, Liz Farrell, back in the studio, which I am very grateful for because that means I don't have to talk as much, and you'll probably be grateful because you don't have to listen to me as much. We're also going to have Jen Wood, our researcher, back in the studio. Jen was on the show a few weeks ago. She's been pulling all sorts of new stuff related to the Murdochs and some other stories that we're going to be very interested in updating you on. Jen Wood and Liz will be in the studio next week. I also want to tell you about an interview we're going to conduct on the medical marijuana issue. Jill Swing, one of the top advocates for medical marijuana. Her daughter, Mary Louise, suffers from seizures. She has been advocating for this bill for more than eight years. Jill Swing is going to come in the studio and tell us why she's pushing for the passage of this bill. We're also going to talk about the Bowen Turner case again next week. There's a big rally at the South Carolina State House. Fitz News is going to be there. We're going to talk to the victims. We're going to talk to the advocates. We're going to update you on what's happening in that case and their progress in trying to get some laws changed and some reforms in the South Carolina General Assembly. Also next week, we're going to travel down to Beaufort for a forum involving First District Congresswoman Nancy Mace. Nancy has got some issues down in the Beaufort area. Some Republican voters aren't particularly fond of her down there, but she's going to stick her head in the lion's mouth. And down there in Bluffton, South Carolina, we will be there with our cameras to see how she's received. And also, Attorney General Alan Wilson will be at that hearing, which will be very interesting because, again, uh, Attorney General Wilson's father, Congressman Joe Wilson, has endorsed Mesa's rival in her bid for a second term in Congress. So we're expecting some real fireworks in Bluffton, South Carolina next week. Our cameras will be there to capture all that. So look forward to all that this coming week on Fitz News. And thank you for checking in to our Week in Review.